I, Count Dietrich von Dibbelberg, now known mostly by the abridged name Count Dibula, well aware of certain misconceptions and misunderstandings about myself and my history, hereby set down these details so that others may finally know the truth. When telling a story, one should always begin at the beginning. But what is the beginning? A biography usually begins with the subject's birth and concludes with their death. It's a simple enough convention for most people. They are born, they live, they die, the end. However, death was not the end for me. It was another beginning. You might say one of many, actually. So where do I begin? I suppose I should first make clear that while I now call Earth home, I was not born here. I was born in a place called Etia. The relationship between this world and my own is unknown to me. Whether it is another planet somewhere in the cosmos, as yet undiscovered by Earthlings, some sort of alternate timeline, or is on an entirely different plane of existence, I cannot say. I'm afraid that my arrival here and how such a journey was possible remains a mystery even to me. A mystery that one day I hope to solve so that I can return. Ah, but how confusing this could all become. Let us use the natural flow of a biography and trust in its convention to bring clarity. I'm afraid there was nothing extraordinary about my birth. My beginning is perhaps only remarkable in its lack of remarkability. I was born simply Dietrich, no surname, on a snowy winter evening in a small farming village called Dibbleburg, situated just south of the Norgrim Pass. At that time, this land marked part of the western border of the kingdom of Athala. The fourth child of a simple blacksmith, there were no celebrations to welcome my arrival. If anything, the general atmosphere leaned toward the opposite end of the emotional spectrum to rest somewhere between apathy and despair. I was informed by my mother when I was but a toddler that I was an unwanted burden upon the resources of an already stretched family. After my sister's birth, she said they did not want any more children and that I was an unwelcomed accident. From that moment onward then, in her eyes, every calamity that befell our family, every misfortune Zamira laid upon us was my responsibility. According to her, had I not gotten in the way of her dreams, then everything would have worked out better for everyone else. It was an absurd sentiment that I first learned to ignore, for even then I knew it was not I who had chosen to be born. I could not feel guilt for an action I did not choose, and she could not achieve what I believe was the intended goal of this shared revelation. I saw that guilt trips were her preferred method of control, and lacking that feeling of guilt, she found it quite difficult to control me. In time, I began to revel in her resentment. The more she hated me, the less I cared about her, and I found a certain level of satisfaction in her distress or discomfort, whether I'd caused it or not. This notion that I had somehow destroyed her life before I was even born began to appeal to me, and I began to not only accept credit for doing so, but to take pride in it. Thus, I was a destroyer long before I was old enough to wield my first sword. In many ways, my childhood was just as miserable as any other peasant child's. Marked by constant labor and periods of privation, the lives of poor people aren't much different no matter where you go. We all struggled to make the best of the bad hand the gods dealt us, and I was no different. During the days I labored in the smithy, stoking the forges and moving materials about, it was drudgery. Mind-numbing, soul-deadening drudgery. And I was not at all satisfied with it. I was a rambunctious youth, full of energy and imagination. Such mindless labor could never satisfy me, and I could not accept such a destiny. While I worked, my mind swam with possibilities. The future others envisioned may reside within these soot-covered walls, but I knew that my own lay far away from here. I had no idea when or how I would get there, but the horizons mercilessly beckoned me toward them. I did not have to wait long. In Etia, no one wishes you good luck. For it is known that Zamira, the goddess of fortune, or Lady Luck if you prefer, maintains balance. Fortune and misfortune go hand in hand. To wish one person good luck is to invite misfortune upon another, perhaps even yourself. And it is this balance that brought about the first change in my destiny. War is generally seen as bad fortune, and there's no denying that for the many it very much is. But it was war and misfortune of others that first plucked me out of my drudgery and changed my future. When looking back, it is somewhat difficult to decide exactly when a war began. Was it the first time blades crossed in anger? 
Was it months before when opposing sides were marshalling their strength and planning their moves upon the great cosmic chessboard? Or does the chain reaction go years back to some pompous noble upset about an insignificant slight of courtesy? After a war, historians devote their time to making these long chain connections. But history is written by the winner of the conflict, and thus recorded history itself carries with it a somewhat biased narrative in favor of the victor. All this is my admittedly long-winded way of saying I have no idea what actually caused the first Viso War. For my part, it started with the invasion and occupation of Wittich. I must apologize for what may be a boring history lesson, and I will endeavor to keep it as brief as possible, but it is necessary in order to explain how this related to my change in fortune. The recorded history tells us that the Visobian Empire asked Athala to cede control of Wittich to the Empire. Wittich is a fairly large and prosperous trading port located downstream from Dibbleburg at the mouth of the Sapphire River. Visobians had been immigrating there for years, but now there were a significant number of them and Emperor Kosan suggested Athala allow them to join the Empire. In exchange, he offered a peace and mutual protection treaty to guarantee the continued safety and prosperity of Athala. In reality, it was a threat, not a suggestion. Visobian history is rife with such treaties. Visobia had made such deals with other small kingdoms and city-states as far back as anyone can even remember. Each one of those treaties was eventually violated, and city after city became just another part of the expanding empire. Appeasement does not work with the Visobians, and despite the military advantage the empire had at the time, Athala refused to be intimidated. Two days after Athala's refusal, the Visobian army crossed the border and invaded, demonstrating that they had dispatched their forces before their proposal was even delivered to King Vidimir. The garrison at Wittich was ill-prepared. Years of peace had led to complacency. They were ill-equipped and poorly trained. The Visobians took control of the city with very little damage to their own forces, leaving them in a strong position to continue their conquest. The loss of Wittich made Dibbleburg the most important place in all of Athala. The Norgrim Pass was the only chance to bottle up the Visobian army and prevent them from deploying their full strength on the open fields of Athala. Dibbleburg had to hold or Athala would fall. It was quite a precarious situation. If the Visobian forces marched out right away, the Athalan army would not be able to reach Dibbleburg in time to block their advance. But what choice did they have? Athalon's army must march out to meet them. General Braga, commander of the Athalon forces, sent out orders for any and all troops to make their way to Dibbleburg with all haste. Piece by piece from across the kingdom, units began their rapid march toward the pass. Whether through their commander's incompetence or perhaps Zamera smiled upon Athala, no one really knows, but the Visobians did not advance right away. Taking some time to get organized and ensure control over Wittich delayed them. When they finally marched out toward Dibbleburg, General Braga had enough forces within reach to stall their advance, and he was gaining more every day as his army came through Dibbleburg piece by piece. I remember the first time I saw a unit of mounted knights trotting in formation through the center of town. Until then, I had only heard stories about knights in shining armor, stories that always praised them for their honor, courage, and good deeds. They were shining examples of virtue, and the moment I saw them, I thought, this was the life for me. This is where I belonged, on horseback, fighting the good fight, not stuffed away in a dingy smithy hammering hot steel. I see far more clearly now. They were just fairy tales. The reality of military life is far less glamorous, and many men in shiny armor have no more honor than a dead dog, believe me. There is nothing glamorous on a battlefield. It is a place of desperate struggle, pain, misery, and death. A soldier on a battlefield does not fight for honor and glory. He fights for survival. He kills not for some greater good, but because he must kill to survive. However, wisdom comes with age, and at the time, I was young and naive. I looked upon them as the righteous hand of the gods, and I wanted to be one of them. My father was suddenly very busy repairing armor and weapons throughout the battle, and it fell upon me to deliver them. This constant presence among the knights and soldiers was a thrill for me and didn't go unnoticed. It would pay unexpected dividends when the war was over. The Athlon forces held for days against repeated assaults. The Visobian army was built for speed, much more suited to fighting upon open plains where they could outmaneuver the enemy. 
Being bottled up in the pass, facing off against the heavier armor and weapons of the Athlon forces was not the fight they had come for, and day after day the casualties mounted and their hope of victory slipped away. After a week of battle, the Vesobian force had lost so many men that even if they could break the Athlon line, they simply did not have enough force left to pursue their conquest, nor could they hope to stop the Athlon army if General Braga chose to advance, so they withdrew. First back to Wittich, and after a little push from General Braga's forces, they fled back across the border. The history books say that King Vidimir chose not to invade Vesobia. They like to extol his virtue and tell us that he was only interested in repelling the Vesobian assault, not conquest. They say he ordered General Braga to stop the pursuit after Wittich had been reclaimed and deliver peace terms to Emperor Kosan. The truth, I suspect, was quite different. Athala was victorious, yes, but victory did not come without a price. The casualty numbers suggest that General Braga had lost more than half of his force, and what remained would simply not be enough to invade Vesobia. It was pragmatism, not virtue, that ended the war. It was those heavy losses that brought about my good fortune. Many of the surviving knights were in need of new squires, and a knight named Sir Caledon approached my parents to buy my service. Drawing squires from the peasantry was a rather unusual step, but to replenish the ranks, it was necessary, and I suspect that Sir Caledon saw something in me that he could work with. My mother practically jumped at the chance to get rid of me. The money he offered certainly didn't hurt, but she'd have agreed to it for nothing just to be rid of me. Where he was taking me or what he would do with me was entirely beside the point for her. I would finally be out of her way. On the next morning, I gathered up what few clothes I possessed. With a few goodbyes and even fewer tears, I was off with Sir Caledon toward the unknown. I had no idea what really lay ahead of me, but I didn't care. I knew what lay behind me, and I hoped I might never return to it.